The Lord be with you, beloved online pillar community, near and far. We gather this morning to worship God who promises to meet us by his word and at his table. Uh, pastor Joel Borsma, our college ministries pastor at Pillar, will be preaching among us today. And as we gather for worship, some of our friends will welcome us. The Lord be with you, Pillar community. We are the Clonicsville family. It is a gift to worship together today, whether you are joining us online or in person. We look forward to the day when our full community can be back together again. But for now, let's prepare our hearts and minds to worship as the Ensemble leads us. anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. God has gathered us from many places to draw near, to listen, that we might experience and hear the new thing that God is doing. Let's worship and sing together.
so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this comes from God, who has reconciled us to himself in Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Our God is making all things new. And we are invited to proclaim it. But our words and our actions so often continue to fall short. So short. Those old habits keep breaking in. Painful patterns continue to show up. We need God. So this morning, we're going to pray. Pray for God to heal and restore, for God to come to us. We'll begin our prayer with singing. Let's pray. Awesome and compassionate God, you have loved us with unfailing, self-giving mercy, but we have not loved you. You constantly call us, but we do not listen. You ask us to love, but we walk away from neighbors in need, wrapped up in our own concerns. We condone evil, prejudice, warfare, and greed. God of grace, as you come to us in mercy, we repent in spirit and in truth. Admit our sin and gratefully receive your forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. good news 
who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. And Christ prays for us. Amen. This is the good news. In Christ, we are forgiven. We are united to God, and we are now free to offer our lives in any part that they might, they, they might play for God's kingdom. Let's respond to this good news by singing, I am one. established peace for us and so that's how we want to live too in peacemaking in the peacekeeping ways of Jesus in our lives and the world around us 
our website, PillarChurch.com, has a number of helpful resources available for engaging with both our church and our community together. It's a great place to start if you're wanting to participate with us in life and faith. There's also a Give link available there. Another opportunity you'll find on our website is a list of items to bless Pillar grads through care packages. So if you can participate um, and you can bring those items to the office by tomorrow, it would be a gift to us and to them. Coming up on February 17 is an in-person Ash Wednesday service that we will host here at Pillar at 6 p.m., um, which will include a special kind of dinner that you'll get to take with you as you leave afterwards. We'll also have a service available online for you to participate and worship with us that way on Ash Wednesday. And beginning in March is Alpha Online. Um, and signups are available right now on our website. They're pretty easy to find. And now is the time if you've been praying for a family member, for a friend, um, or maybe it's you who's feeling a nudge to come. Um, anyone who needs a safe place to talk about life, questions, doubts, the big things of both life and faith, um, we'd love for you to join us. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. My email is jenna at pillarchurch.com. And now, as we prepare to hear the word of God, let's sing together, Take My Life. With you. My name is Joel Borsma, and as Jenna said earlier, I have the unbelievable privilege of serving as Pillars College pastor as well as directing Young Life College on Hope's campus, and it really is a privilege. If you had asked me when I was a youngster what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a Hope College basketball player, and by that, what I really meant was a Hope college student. Because my dad was a chaplain at Hope growing up, I was just always around Hope students. Cool cats like John Brown and Ryan Tannis and so many others 
that I just got to hang around. What an absolute privilege. And I get to do it still. And we get to do it together. Rooting on college students, praying for them, walking alongside for all the students right next door. And it's also a privilege to open up God's word with you this morning. So let's turn there now. We're still on the way with Luke, picking up at chapter 7, verse 1. After he, that is, Jesus, finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he built for us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come out to you, but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I, too, am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowds, said to them, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had returned to the house, they found the servant well. Soon afterward, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier and the bearers, stood still. And he said, young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. St. Luke, who remains our companion and guide on the Jesus way, sets before us two scenes today. Two scenes, two casts of characters, two towns which result in two healings. Luke, in the end, gives us two glimpses of the inbreaking kingdom of God. With that in view, there are three things that I want to track with you today, given these two accounts, and they are that Jesus marvels, Jesus sees, and Jesus announces. Let's have a look. To set the scene, we're on the way with Jesus back in Capernaum. You might recall, it's where Jesus went right after he was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth back in chapter 4. And it becomes the base of operations for Jesus' ministry. Capernaum, along with two other small towns, form what we now call the Evangelical Triangle. It's where the majority of Jesus' teaching and preaching took place. Back in Capernaum, Luke first introduces us to a centurion, a Roman military official 
who is basically the captain of a small troop. He would have had something like a hundred soldiers under his authority, and he's on the ground, and they are on the ground to maintain stability and good order in the name of the Roman Empire. Back, uh, the centurion had a servant who was on his deathbed. So he sent for Jewish elders to see if they could locate Jesus, who at this point wouldn't be too hard to find. The crowds are following him. He had gained quite a reputation in the region for all of his extraordinary healings. The elders agreed to the centurion's request. And did you catch what they said to Jesus? He, that is the centurion, he is worthy of, to have you do this for him. How does that sit with you? I'll say it again. He is worthy to have you do this for him. Seems a bit bold. The centurion, though, did have all the right stuff. He had military merit, political pull, by all means, a respectable fellow and a humanitarian. He had, after all, built the synagogue for the religious locals, and we have no reason to think it was in bad faith. But again, he is worthy? Not sure how that sits with you, but it strikes me as a fairly familiar script. He's worthy, meritocracy. He earned it. He deserved it. He's entitled to it. It's the way the world went then, and it's the way the world goes now. He is worthy to have you do this for him. Then I wonder if you noticed, Jesus didn't say anything, although I have a hunch Jesus has another way in mind. Jesus simply went with them. But before Jesus can even ring the doorbell, the centurion had a message for him. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Huh. Hold on a minute. That's not the message we just got from the elders. The centurion seemed to know something that the elders themselves didn't admit. Here's a Roman military man and a Gentile who had a better grasp, seemingly, of the human condition than the trained religious Leaders who, of course, were schooled in Israel's scriptures. But it's the centurion, in this case, who's closer to the psalmist, who said, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Or the prophet Isaiah, all our righteousness are like filthy rags. The centurion knew something about the plight of the human heart, knew that in Samuel Johnson's words, Depravity is not easily overcome. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Now, if the centurion stopped there, it'd leave him, in fact, with most of the world's religions and ethical systems. It's the case that C.S. Lewis builds in his classic Mere Christianity that there's some kind of rule and right, rule of right and wrong, or law of human nature, which none of us made, but we find pressing on us. The centurion seems pretty much on board with what Lewis would write several centuries later, some semblance of conscience or an objective moral order. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. But then he goes on to say something even more stunning. The centurion, again, a military man and a Gentile, called Jesus Lord. Did you catch this? He calls Jesus Lord and then adds, I too am a man set under authority. The centurion confessed the authority and lordship of Jesus. And I absolutely love the word Luke uses to describe Jesus' response. Jesus marveled. Not even in Israel have I found such faith. Isn't that amazing? Jesus marveled. Not at the centurion's military merits or political pull or social status or philanthropic 
deeds, but at his faith. The faith that Jesus made possible in the first place. Jesus marvels. He will take even our most meager offering and make good on it and bear fruit from it. Jesus takes the two fish and five loaves of our faith and he multiplies it for the good of his kingdom and for the world he loves. This is the first hint of the great gospel invasion that comes a little bit later in the story. In fact, in Luke's second volume, so stay tuned for that. Jesus marvels. I hope that's good news for you wherever you're at in life and in faith. Maybe you've been on the long obedience of discipleship for a long time. Jesus marvels, and he'll continue to bear fruit from your faith. Maybe you still have a lot of questions about Jesus, who he was and who he is and what it's all about. He marvels at that too, and if that's you, you're in good company. And some called it faith-seeking understanding. This goes deep into the Christian tradition. And if that's you, I'd love to join you in the conversation. Jesus marveled. Not even in Israel have I found such faith. Jesus marveled. And when they returned to the house, they found the servant well. But Luke, our trusty companion and guide, doesn't stop there. The story goes on. Jesus on the way to the next town and the next encounter. This time, Jesus comes upon a funeral procession. Relative to the men of merit in our previous scene, this is the complete opposite. Here is a widow who has lost it all. Being a woman in the ancient world already would have put her at a major disadvantage. And if the situation weren't dire enough, by the time Jesus arrives, the widow's son, her only son, was already dead. And if there's any doubt the young man had died, Luke makes it mighty clear. Two times in four verses, Luke tells us the young man had died. The widow's son, already in the coffin, the procession, already underway, the shock of uh, the shock and grief of death already real. The widow, overlooked by the world, no status, no support, and now no reason for hope, finds Jesus in front of her, and Jesus saw her. He took notice of her vulnerable state and had compassion on her. Compassion, that is literally to come alongside the suffering of another. And I wonder if there's someone who needs to hear that today, that Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus comes alongside. I certainly need to hear it. For so many of us, it's been a year of massive loss. And this part of the text really struck a chord with me. January 2, 2021, my grandma Borsma died of the COVID-19 virus. And maybe you've lost a loved one too and know what I mean and need to hear it again. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus comes alongside. Earlier this week, some great friends I went to Hope with lost their baby just days before the due date. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, Jesus comes alongside. It's been a year of massive loss. And even if you are getting along okay relative to all the havoc, you're going to need to hear this at some point. Jesus sees, Jesus knows, and Jesus comes alongside. But the story doesn't end there either. Jesus stumbled upon a funeral procession. He saw the widow, and he showed her compassion. And then Jesus announced, arise. Two scenes, two casts of characters, two towns, two healings, and one person at the center of the action. Jesus announces, arise. 
Jesus is the Lord of life and death. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. The story Luke's telling, the centurion story, the widow story, your story, my story. It's the whole gospel story, and it announces arise. It's precisely what Christianity is about, says C.S. Lewis. The world is a great sculptor shop, and we are the statues. And there's a rumor going around that some of us someday are going to come to life. Jesus announces arise, and fear sees them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. What's true then is true now. In Jesus Christ, God visits. God comes down. God comes near. And God pursues. Jesus announces, arise. And he's doing it still. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God invites us to the table of grace where Jesus Christ offers to us his body and blood. If you believe in Jesus and acknowledge him as Savior, you're welcome to partake in this way. If you're not at that place in life or in faith, that is okay. Uh, We don't want you to do anything that's inauthentic to who you are. We're so grateful that you've joined us today. The body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you.
about to enter into every sector of public life to claim it for Christ. So as you do, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. King of 